This is Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, the founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute, where we help leaders be future ready. Today, we're recording on-site at Amazon's Fulfillment Facility in South Seattle for the 2023 Delivering the Future event. We will discuss Amazon's innovations, artificial intelligence, and the leadership that makes it possible. In this segment, we're going to talk to David Carbone, VP of Prime Air, talking about taking drone delivery to new heights. So, David, I'm so excited to be talking to you. Before we talk about what's happening in Prime Air and your drones, which is very exciting, tell us a little bit about how you lead the organization. Thanks for having me. Firstly, it's wonderful to be on this podcast. For me, it's about encouraging people to do what they do. I can't do everything, nor does anybody want me to do everything, nor should I do everything. We have a fantastic array of people from all walks of life that you can learn from every day. And if you actually enjoy learning, what I can do is sort of listen, guide, motivate. But then obviously you have to set a standard, right? You have to set a standard for what's acceptable. Behavioral, people know the general behavior stuff. People know not to cross the line. If they do, there's going to be implications. But like sometimes people can get wrapped up in their little thing and perfect becomes the enemy of good enough. And so knowing when to push them to move on to the next thing and deliver for the customers. That's what we do as leaders, point. And so that's the hill we're taking. Let's take the hill. As we got started, you were saying leading beyond cliches. We've all heard them on podcasts. We've read them on blogs. Tell us a little bit more about how you really balance operationally getting really great outcomes and innovation, which requires kind of throwing out the rules. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of cliches. You know, it was easy. Everyone would do it. It's a bit like, I don't know, I've got four kids. And I remember trying to raise four kids under four. My wife did all the work and people would come up with these really helpful sort of sayings. Oh, enjoy it because they'll be gone before you know it. And when I've got four of them with a fever, what am I going to do with that? Right? It's not very helpful, guys. Right? <laughs> Thanks. The front door's there. <laughs> so for me, what we can do when you're doing something that's innovative, that you just can't sit still, right? Innovation's a bit like cement. If you stand too long, it freezes on you and it's useless. For me, it's you make sure everybody understands the vision. Not what a vision is, but what is that vision? Where are you going? You know, what's the hill we need to take? What's the one after that we need to take? Why are we taking it? Well, who's it for? And what does it service? What's the bigger picture need? And then what are the goals that you need? You know, what are the strategies we're going to use and what are the goals? What are the actual goals? And what's your responsibility within those goals? What's your job and what's your job? And then once everybody's clear on that, then it's about what is the cadence by which you're going to run the business? And does everybody know that cadence? Innovation's hard. When you bring something online that's generational, no one's done it before. So there's going to be mistakes. And everybody automatically wants to re-engineer it. They send the engineers in and all the engineers want to re-engineer because that's what they know. The manufacturing people want to build more, get more people build more. And no one stops to say, well, oh, hang on a minute. Do we actually all know what the target is? Do we all know what your role is? You know, we've sent a hundred people in. Do they all know exactly what their role is? Do we all know how we're measuring success? Do we all know what good enough is? And then what's the cadence by which we're going to cycle through this? I don't think we put enough focus on that and innovation needs it. What is the first thing we need to achieve? What's the second thing we need to achieve? What's the third thing we need to achieve? You know, and then having a sense of humor all the way through it, this is tough enough. You know, you look at everything like, I don't know, it's like looking at paint dry seriously. Like it's my touch, look at paint. You'd sort of probably laugh at them. I want you to stare at the wall, the paint's going to dry. Do it seriously. Are you kidding me? Right? Have some fun. Make history, have some fun. With that as the framework, let's talk about what you're doing with drones mm -hmm. and Prime Air, because it's really cool to see. I have to be the most incredibly lucky human being on earth, I've got to tell you, based on the career I've had. But it's funny, people automatically index to drones. But our job, aside from how we do it, is to deliver an ultra-fast delivery service to our customers. And that is to provide a delivery service that ultimately can get people the packages they want and they need where they are within 30 minutes click to delivery. And the drone, frankly, is a part of that. It's not the entire part of it. Now, we're choosing to do it via drone because it's the best way we know to do it to achieve that 30 minutes. But if you think about it as a holistic experience, we also got to amend the Amazon stack up front so it can process an order in 15 minutes, right? Because we need 11 minutes to fly it and you need four minutes in between to take the package from its point in fulfillment to the drone. So 
our goal is to do that at a targeted level of safety that's magnitudes safer than driving to the store. And we used to say two times safer than driving to the store, but we're beyond that now. And so that's our mission. Our mission is to create a capability for 30 minute click to delivery. We talked earlier to the pharmacy folks, and I understand why 30 minutes for my pharmacy, my medication is important. Not necessarily for my leggings. <laughs> if you're cold, it's important. Or if I'm not dressed. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't advise going outside without them. You might want to call the drone. Why is 30 minutes the standard? One thing we know beyond the shadow of a doubt is no one's ever happy with the delivery speed they get a package through e-commerce. You know, if you look at what you would drive to the store for, typically is about the size of the package that we have in the drone, like five pounds shoebox size. It's typically what people go to the store to go and get urgently. And if you think about sustainability and taking cars off the road, right? And then you think about how accidents happen on the road with people being distracted or in a rush, 30 minutes feels about right. And from a customer perspective, I know when I want something or I need something, I want it. And I don't want to wait an hour or two hours or three hours. I want it now. And so 30 minutes is the targets that were set based on what we understand that customers want. And the reality is, and there's more than enough data on this, speed drives convenience, convenience drives customer fellowship. And that's what people need. That's what people want. That's what we plan to give them. I'm looking for the term and I don't see it, that the drone functions like a helicopter. VTOL. VTOL. Why is that important? We've sort of looked at people's backyards or people's yards, more importantly, and where we want to deliver. And VTOL allows us to get into those yards while being in a tight area, but not close enough to be a nuisance and not somebody to be tugging on the drone or in the way. You know, we're not bombing our customers with a package from altitude while flying at speed, right? We're gently placing something down. It's very different to what everybody else does. We're proud of that, but we do it for the customer and the community. So if you think about, I mean, if you take the various aspects of it, right, you can get into tighter places. Two, you can deliver to tighter places. Three, no one can yank on a chain that's hanging off the bottom of the drone. A dog can't jump up and grab it. A rambunctious child can't. A rambunctious <laughs> child. Not that they ever are. But yeah, it's probably more the adults are worried about. You're not dropping a package from an extremely high altitude and deploying a parachute where it can sort of end anywhere. So it gives us this controllability over the process. And ultimately, when you do that, you're reducing your noise signature, right? So you get in, 90 seconds, package is deployed, delivered, and you're out of there. So we think it's the safest way to do it. We think it's the most convenient way to do it. We've invested the time and the energy and the money in creating that capability. And this is happening in College Station, Texas now? Yes, ma'am. That's the first city. College Station, Texas and Lockford, California. So when's it coming to Columbus, Ohio? We plan to scale around the US post next year. Post next year. Our plan right now is we'll bring the drone into service. We'll secure the approvals we need. And that part is relatively well understood now, which is great. Kudos to the FAA and our team for working with them and all the other participants. And then from there, it's you get the approvals and you go, you start opening up. How many of them are in a location? Because if it's 15-minute delivery, I can't wait for the drone to come back from its last delivery. It's not like the pizza guy where there's one of them. Yeah, and he's probably carrying 20 pizzas. So we have a roadmap, and the roadmap has all the normal things that you would expect on a roadmap. For us, it's opening facilities, and then we put the drones in those facilities let's just say it's 10 or 20 to start with. And for us, it's all about concurrency, how many drones you can have in the air at the same time. So we're focused on that. And then demand will dictate. So we're creating a capability. That's the beauty of this Mark 30 system. We're creating a capability that can scale, but the platform remains the same. So you design into a safety target that you know will suit the population densities you want to be in. You then prove that capability, and then you add features on it for the environment that you're operating in. So if you're in California and San Diego, you don't need to worry too much about snow. If you're in Columbus, I think you do. And so we create that capability over the next couple of years. But the baseline platform is what we bolt onto from this point on. Is there a pilot for each drone or do you kind of program and they go off and do their thing? We call it semi-autonomous because there is a human that oversees all of it. They're not pilots per se, they're operators, drone operators, and that's all federally regulated. And if you've ever been to Tokyo train station, right? Not every train is a human driving it, but there's a control center. And that's how we've designed our system and we'll scale into that. As with the other areas of robotics and AI, the volume of people is also scalable. You can scale this without one person, one drone. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a system. You design a system. That's why I sort of often say to people, it's not just the drone, right? The drone's just the thing you see. There's a whole uh, system behind it. And the system works up intervals, right? So it gears. So, you know, you've got this many, you have this operator, you have that many, you have this many operators. And then there's a team around them. There's techs and mechanics and all, again, regulated. So almost like air traffic control. Yeah, that's a really good way to think about the system, if you think about it. So if you traveled here to Seattle, you had to buy a ticket. No one thinks about getting a ticket, right? And then you've got to get through security at the airport. And then when you get through security, you've got to go to a gate. And then when you're at the gate, somebody has to let you on the airplane. And then you're on the airplane. Airplane is independent, but related to the airport, right? Now someone's in control of the airplane, this cabin crew. Now the airplane lands at an airport. It's all the other stuff in reverse, but now you've got to get your luggage. And when you get your luggage, you go catch a cab and get in a cab. Now you're home. That whole system is basically what we're charged with creating for delivery. Cause you've got to sign a drone. You've got to operate the drone. You've got to operate it from somewhere. You've got to collect a package. You've got to take it to a customer. Then you've got to come back, get a package, do it again. And you have to control the airspace. And you've got to refuel the drone or recharge the drone. Yeah, you swap the battery. Think about that ecosystem that happens. You, know, you look up, you see the airplane, very sexy. But that's just one part of the logistical system around it. And we, we have to do exactly the same thing. So you're running an entire aviation ecosystem. Well, yes. That's great for my ego, yes. <laughs> What is the most exciting part for you of doing this work? We could be here for another three podcasts. But for me, if you meet with the customers, you know, there's lots written in the press and, you, you know, like all that sort of stuff. And some people just always want to look at the downside, right? And innovation's not easy. It's not easy, right? So it's easy to take pot shots at. But when you speak to a customer who you're actually there and, you know, I'm smiling because when you're there and they're getting it, everybody's doing the same thing, right? Everyone's smiling. It's like, it's unbelievable. Everyone's excited and it's there. And then you turn up for the next delivery and they're still excited. And albeit I say to my team, our mission is to make people not even think about the drone. Eventually this should just be, wow, how do I ever live without getting my package in 30 minutes? And no one even talks about the drone, but just being with our customers and our employees, you know, when we flew that first drone, I was fortunate enough to be at Boeing when we flew the first 787, the first 787-9 and the first 787-10, right? And that feeling when something takes off for the first time, you put your heart and soul into. So when we were in watching that first Mark 30 take off, no strings attached, and then watching people just emotionally work their tails off to bring this innovation to our customers and then seeing the customer reaction to it, that's what you live for. That's, that's where you, you feel pretty lucky to be working in this area, but just happy to be alive. Thank you for sharing that with us. So what do you want our listeners to be thinking about innovation or AI or drones or running an aviation ecosystem? We do it for them. We think of our communities, we think of our customers, and we think about making their life better. And that's what we're designing for. And if you can think about all the reasons that innovation is good, I always bring it back to us personally, right? Us individually. You know, I'm wearing glasses today because my contact tour. <laughs> I, I would have paid good money to have a contact dropped off here so I could actually see. I told this story in Australia to a media outlet and, you know, my father's 95 and he can't hear a thing, right? If he doesn't have his hearing aids, it's torturous, right? And sometimes I think he does it just to torture us. But he was out in the garden and his hearing aid fell out and um, we couldn't talk to him. So, you know, I was in Australia, I was on vacation. We found it, right? It remarkably, this hearing aid was in the garden. We found it. Well, the battery was flat. And again, it's like, you know, my dad's 95. I don't want my dad in a car driving to get a battery. My sister or I could click to get him a battery for that hearing aid. He's set, right? So I know there's lots of cutesy, cutesy stuff about delivering a coffee and I don't need a coffee that desperately, but there's real utility that will make people's lives better through innovation. And that's why I always support it. We were at a yoga retreat in yurts, pouring rainstorm for about 14 hours. The yurt leaked and one of the participants' medication was drowned. She needed the medication. And if there was delivery of medication to the <laughs> yoga retreat center <laughs> off the grid, yep. it would have made a huge difference. Some of these things are really beyond just convenient. They're foundational to people's health. Yeah. I mean, if you're diabetic, if you're asthmatic, you can run through all of these things, right? And there's that end too, but there's also, you've got people coming over for dinner. It's pretty stressful if you're making 
I don't know. I was going to say you're making steaks on a barbecue and you forgot the steaks. You got other problems, but you know, if you're making a pasta sauce or something and you forgot an onion, it can get you out of a jam. Life is stressful enough. And so for me, as long as the people doing the innovating are responsible and using standards, right? We're not just creating standards. That's why we keep pushing the, there's an aerospace standard. Whilst the regulation set may not always be defined, that's okay. We'll help define it. But there are coding standards for aerospace products. There are hardware standards. There are production standards. And just saying we flew our drone a lot means nothing to me because we want to be able to meet a standard that assures our communities and our customers that they can be really confident in the technology that's being used around them to make their lives better. David, thank you. What a treat to talk to you. No, thank you. It was cool. I really appreciate it. We look forward to talking to you again. Can't wait. Joining me in this segment are John Love, VP Amazon Pharmacy, and Dr. Vin Gupta, Chief Medical Officer, Amazon Pharmacy. And we're going to be talking about an evolution in healthcare delivery. Welcome. Let's talk about the idea of pharmacy in your pocket and managing the golden window. John, do you want to start with what is Amazon announcing and how is that going to impact all users? Sure. So today we are specifically announcing that customers in College Station, Texas, are going to be able to get prescription medications delivered in 60 minutes or less via primary drone. This announcement is kind of along a series of work and inventions the team has made around saving customers time and saving them money in pharmacy. The pharmacy experience in the United States is largely the way it's been for decades. So 90 plus percent of medications are dispensed. It's full responsibility of the patient to go drive, accommodate whatever hours and facilities are available stand in line and potentially discuss a personal health condition out in you know the public and you're surprised by what you pay at the end and then that happens across a range of healthcare we think there's a better way you know i believe the pandemic started to tilt the awareness on proactively engaging in our health and adopting more digital means of health amazon pharmacy literally is a pharmacy in your pocket we already deliver two day prime shipping prescription medications to patients across the united states and we've launched a series of programs to save people money today we were talking about a really exciting new launch around saving people time and dr gupta why is that so important well i will say when we zoom out amazon pharmacy you know we often say we don't exist because the united states needs another pharmacy it needs a fundamentally better pharmacy the golden window is something we don't talk about a lot to the American public because it's something that I think we're all now familiarizing ourselves year four into knowing what COVID-19 is, this virus that caused this global pandemic. But time to treatment matters. And I say this as a practicing pulmonologist in traditional healthcare. We are not able at scale, frankly, to meet patients where they're at, which is providing care conveniently on demand. If somebody wakes up unwell as we enter cold and flu season, helping them figure out what's wrong, maybe helping them arrive at a diagnosis. We have across our connected health services, one medical Amazon clinic, we have the ability to make sure that if patients need to speak to a healthcare provider to understand what might be happening, they will have that at a very low cost. But now, as John mentioned, with drone delivery and consultation, we are able to marry that immediate triage experience that we're scaling across the country with, in this case, one hour hyperfast delivery of, say, an acute medication like Tamiflu for flu, should a patient need it and if it's appropriate. And that focus here is, of course, we're starting in one city in Texas. But as David Carbone, the VP of Primer, noted, Primer's long term vision is drone delivery at scale. And we believe that we can reach customers more quickly in cities like Seattle. Phoenix, Austin, Indianapolis, Miami, we have sub-same day capabilities there in terms of delivery of medications direct to doorstep. We are now able over time, incrementally, to build this golden window journey to provide care when people need it the most immediately after a problem is identified. That's what you've been able to create, which I think is phenomenal. What is it about Amazon and how you're structured and how you lead that's allowed you to get here because your competitors aren't in the same place. I would say our fundamental strengths are a bit different, and that enables us to work on a different angle of the problem. So if you think about what Amazon has invested in for many years, not just in pharmacy, but broadly, 
it's a digital forward customer experience. You know, we start every idea with working back from the customer. That was no different than this. This was feedback from users of Primera and College Station. But that digital experience means if you work different hours, if you've got to take kids to soccer practice, like you can engage at the time that is convenient for you versus changing and adapting your schedule around another business. The second, and we could go a little bit deeper into this, is we really lean in and use technology as an enabler to put more of the work and the input on the value creation for customers. And what I mean by that is a lot of the cost of healthcare is tied up in revenue cycle management, prior authorization, moving health records around, data entry, manually reviewing billing. There's a bunch of things where you don't think, well, that was really useful in me getting well. It's usually talking to a provider potentially getting medication that's on your path to wellness. And so we lean heavily into technology to remove the admin burden. You know, I, I see the news like everyone else, like there's a nurse shortage, primary cares are overrun, you know, access, people might be waiting months to be seen by a doctor for certain conditions. And the pharmacy landscape's challenging. You know, stores are closing, hours are reducing, and pharmacists have a lot on their plate. If we can automate more of the admin pieces, that allows more time to be spent on the clinical side. We think there's a lot of value in that. So let me ask from a physician perspective, how do you navigate patient records? Because I'm thinking of clients who've lost family members because they didn't have a centralized repository for information. At the scale of Amazon, I'm assuming you are addressing that kind of question in a way that my local physician may not be able to. Everything that we do from a pharmacy standpoint, there's documentation. And so we certainly are ensuring that there's continuity. That if somebody were to receive some of their care through our health services, that there is the ability to transmit that information if, say, their primary care provider is elsewhere and across the healthcare ecosystem. So we pride ourselves on patient safety, clinical excellence, clear clinical documentation. And should somebody want to transfer their information to a different electronic health record or other repository, they have that opportunity to do so. One Medical has its own electronic medical record, and so they are a primary medical home for their patients. Some of those patients, if they need a medication, might choose to fill that medication through Amazon Pharmacy. But again, we make sure that their data is transmitted in a HIPAA-compliant way, that there's appropriate clinical documentation. And we're ensuring that everything that we do allows for a greater access at a lower cost through price transparency, but that there's continuity of care. That seems foundational in an environment, especially where we're so mobile. I'm here in Seattle. I live in Ohio. I was in Vancouver last week. I'm periodically someplace on the globe. If I get sick, where do my records live? I'm not going to fly back to Ohio when I'm ill, necessarily. And so that the records are electronically with me wherever I am seems like a huge benefit. Let's say for our One Medical part of our healthcare offerings, there's a convenient app for anybody that's a member of One Medical, that's a patient of that ecosystem, where all their information is in that app. And so uh, to your prompt, I would say, Maureen, that those individuals have a one-stop location where their lab values, maybe other studies are readily available at one click, which is very helpful, especially if they're on the move. Back to how do you lead, how does AI enable you to develop these services? You talk about client backward. So I look at the objective I want to accomplish, then look at where I am and fill the gap. How's AI enabling that? I can give a few specific examples. So one is, you know, we mapped the process and a video that we've shown here at this event. How does a prescription go from being kind of a prescription from the doctor to medication in your hand? And we looked at where is the value created, and it's the clinical review, to Vin's point. It's checking the other medications you might be on, looking for allergies, looking for interactions, making sure the strength is appropriate. That's value add. You certainly want that. It's making sure the exact right medications get properly packaged, securely labeled, and then delivered to you. Those are all value add. But we also found there was a lot of wait time, energy, effort spent in data entry. People were reading information on one screen and typing it into a second screen. In billing, there's innumerable reject codes. You know, your refill is too soon. Uh, we need a prior authorization. These turn into sad paths for customers where you go to a pharmacy, your meds aren't ready or we're not able to dispense. And so we spent a lot of energy using entity recognition, actually, in the data entry stage. And we actually found that models trained can find the right information, the name of the drug, the strength of the drug, the directions more accurately and consistently than humans. And it still goes to a pharmacist review. And if it needs to be checked, it'll be checked again. 
But that was a big area of unlock. Pricing, what really surprised me and what I continue to be frustrated with, you know, as a consumer and someone who participates in healthcare is that you often don't know the cost of products and services in healthcare until the point of receiving them, in some cases in treatment post. But that doesn't need to be the case for pharmacy. We have claims data. Customers have insurance that has formulary with copays on it. And so, you know, we've used machine learning to estimate what a customer is going to pay out of pocket. We know factually that there's a number of people who avoid picking up medication because they just assume they can't afford it. There's many highly effective generic medications that are available at fairly reasonable costs. You know, we're talking under $10 delivered free to your door, even if you have a high deductible or you're in a gap of coverage with our prime programs. And so whether it's fixing a billing error, whether it's cleaning up data entry, whether it's estimating pricing, all these things, they're not glamorous but they consume a lot of time and energy. And if they go wrong, that affects the patient. And so that's been an area we've applied a lot of AI. And I would say, just to lay it on to John, one of his initial comments was talking about the context here. Where are we at? As we enter 2024, you know, we know by the end of the decade, we're going to have a healthcare workforce shortage. We're going to have the greatest society on record, at least in the United States. So how do we do more with less? And John's description of the ways in which we're leveraging AI to make it simpler for our staff to provide care for patients, well, that has the intended effect of allowing for top of license practice for a clinical pharmacist. We have a clinical services team consisting primarily of clinical pharmacists, and all these advances allow them to spend more time talking to patients, discussing their regimens, trying to figure out what might be the best for a specific patient to address maybe an adherence problem. But this allows that interface to actually occur. We're addressing burnout. We're addressing issues that, frankly, in the retail environment, don't allow pharmacists to do their job, lean into their expertise. One of the things you mentioned this morning that I found really curious was something like 85% of coupons provided by the manufacturers don't get matched up and get to me as the recipient of the medication. Yeah, that's correct. So for branded medications that are under intellectual property of a pharmaceutical manufacturer, they often offer programs to reduce the cost for their patients. But how to claim those varies widely and can be really complicated. I had a medication myself where, you know, the question was, did you send in your tax forms to get a coupon? And I'm like, that seemed like an unwieldy process to claim an available discount medication. And you might happen upon a pharmacist who does a really great job, is aware of a coupon, helps you find and access it. But the reality is there's a lot of friction in the process. For us as patients navigating our healthcare journey and knowing what's the right price to pay for a branded cardiovascular medication or something, you know, in a new condition is really, really hard. And so what we see is that only about 15% of those dollars go claimed. And so we worked with those same manufacturers and said, hey, what if we just put it right on the site, made it digital, the customer can just see it, it automatically applies. That's an amazing benefit when we think about the cost of noncompliance. As you've said, often patients don't comply because they're just scared and confused. Yeah, I think it's privacy. We all have different levels of comfort in talking about our personal health situations. You may not want to engage in that. It's fear of affordability. Just assuming based on some prior experience, my gosh, I have no idea what this is going to cost. I can tell you as a young, <laughs> younger individual growing up, my tendency to engage with the healthcare system was when my like, arm was falling off. I did not want to go spend money and do preventative checkups when I felt like I was generally healthy. That was a grudge purchase. Understanding the value of preventative care, the ability to get early identification and live a much healthier life, like it's so important, but we haven't made progress in the United States on this dimension. And so transparency, affordability, and convenience, we believe will translate into adherence, and that's going to create better health outcomes. And we know 20% of medication non-adherence is directly related to cost-related concerns. Patients get prescribed a medication, they go to the retail window, it's too expensive. There's a surprise bill awaiting them. That's a problem. And so to John's point, we believe everything we're doing across coupons, across our prime prescription savings program is going to save people money. But a lot of the problem here is that there is an assumption on the part of the patient that if they have insurance, if they have durable healthcare coverage, that they're going to get the bottom low price just by applying their insurance and paying a copay. What we've seen is that's not necessarily the case. And that in some cases, we can actually provide additional value. Well, yeah, if 85% of people aren't claiming the coupons. Yeah. The first time I got a coupon for medication, I was like, oh, it's only going to be 20 bucks. I went to the counter, it was 500. Yeah. It's like, where's that damn coupon? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. 
I was embarrassed. I didn't want to say, I don't have $500. I wasn't going to just leave it at the counter, but I didn't get that medication again. Yeah. This is why 30% of Americans will skip one or more medications in a given year is either the fear, the embarrassment, or the actual ability to pay. And so that's real. It's creating a broader access problem. And then, of course, you see longer wait times to get seen, less available hours, less available pharmacies. All these things work counter to better health care. Let's go back again to Amazon leadership. What is it that allowed you to say, this seems really cool? How do we fix it? Or this seems really troubling. How do we fix it? Because you've created something that significantly didn't exist. And I'm assuming people in traditional healthcare settings aren't saying, this isn't working, let's keep doing it. Yeah. There are probably a lot of people who want to solve this. I certainly don't think we fixed it, but I'm very excited and energized by the path we're on. And I'm hopeful and, and always engaged, you know, when other like-minded individuals want to make a change. So I'll speak to Amazon Pharmacy because that's what I know best. When we have this discussion, Amazon leadership, we distill it down to a few basic questions, which is one, is this a large customer opportunity or problem? Two, are they well served by the current experiences and offers out there? I think with healthcare, you would probably get a universal it's a big problem. You look at the spend, you look at the fact that we've been unable to improve life expectancy. Is it well served? I would argue in a lot of cases, the experience is regressing. People are having a more challenging time with healthcare. And then the third is, do we have a compelling and differentiated idea that could be a useful choice in and amongst all the options? If you look at what Amazon does broadly for consumers, it's a digital forward storefront. Our pharmacy is in your pocket. It really is on your phone. It's 24-7. That's a different degree of convenience and will have a different engagement than, say, a brick and mortar store. The second is we were just talking about AI technology. Engineering runs deep in our blood and we're good at helping simplify complex spaces. Healthcare is incredibly complex. You brought it up on whether it be the medical records, the billing. I've never seen anything like the revenue cycle management of healthcare. And so we think we have skills that can be helpful there. And lastly is convenient access and delivery. Pharmacy fundamentally is getting a product to a customer. And the closer and easier you can make that line for a customer to get products and services that they enjoy or make their life better, that's inspiring to us. And so along that dimension, we've really been focused on transparency and affordability and price. And the other is saving people time and not having to go drive, wait in line, have that experience. Might be appropriate sometimes, but we think this is going to be a really compelling alternative. No, I, I will say that coming from traditional healthcare, having a foot in traditional healthcare, one thing that, and especially has been revealed over the last three years, is patients fundamentally want to receive their healthcare in a different way. And we saw that in 2019, maybe the early signs of it, that telehealth adoption was something that they were curious about. Getting your medications delivered directly to your doorstep, oh, that was novel, but maybe something that could actually help with adherence or making it easy. We had a black swan event in the COVID-19 pandemic that frankly accelerated those behaviors and those desires. What we're seeing is that if we can deliver it in a way that's trusted, undergirded with clinical excellence, that maybe we can actually improve clinical outcomes. We're very convicted by that. Today's announcement is part and parcel of that broader conviction. That's that North Star that keeps us moving across the range of our businesses, but it's meeting patients where they're at now and I think that's critical, that we're addressing an important desire, demand on their part, but we're meeting a moment. The combination of telehealth and medicine. So I do leadership development with cancer docs. And hearing the stories of patients who can't get there, you know, are traveling long distances, they don't have the funds, and they're choosing not to get the treatments or not to get them in the prescribed cadence. Interesting because we don't think of telehealth for especially cancer patients, but one of the tools that they're creating is laser treatments where they 3D print the thing. And now people in rural communities are, have access to this device rather than there are three docs in the country who deliver this service. That really brings to light the idea that you're making accessible things that wouldn't be accessible to some significant portion of the population. I'll just weigh in on that. We have a sickness system. Mm -hmm. It's focused truly on reaction. There is a problem. Maybe there was a delayed diagnosis. Now there's an end-stage consequence that might warrant a hospitalization. We do not have a health and wellness system focused on keeping people healthy, focused on keeping people at home. And part of that is affordable access, convenience, saving time, price transparency, all these features, that's the John and I are talking about. 
but it's giving them knowledge that if there's a problem, understanding what that problem is, giving them a clear diagnosis as conveniently, as cheaply as possible to then enable a treatment as quickly as possible to hopefully keep them well. That's not how our traditional healthcare system works. COVID really shined a light on that inefficiency, and we're trying to solve that problem. Can I add one thing to that, that the system is so complex to navigate yep. that so many good people just opt out or yep. they get part of the way through and they drop out. And so you've made this, you've said pharmacy in your pocket, you've said time and money, but we don't think about the complexity that you've solved for. That's spot on. You just gave a really good example. You guys were discussing the, maybe I could go see three doctors. Maybe I could get access. Maybe I could afford the travel or the treatment. But it was an unlovable binary choice. And the outcome for the folks that didn't fall into that bucket is they often didn't get treated and they had potentially very negative health outcomes. I think this is an and. There's all the ways that medication and healthcare has behaved. But if you're traveling around, what if you could have an intermittent visit that is a synchronous video visit where... Maybe you're in an area where there isn't an appropriate specialist or a doctor or hours that work, that type of thing. I think for pharmacy, that's where we're really focused is this could be an and. If you walk down the street and you had asked a question about the leadership frame, for us, it's about defining the problem, which is how do you engage and get the care with providers that you need and the products and services to live your healthiest life? That is not the construct of the American pharmacy system. It's got a retail network and a mail order network. That mail order network from 1946, five to 10 day business delivery. If we go walk down the street, I don't think anyone on the street is going to define, oh, I've got a mail order need or a retail need. They have a health need. And when medication's appropriate, they want to get access to that medication. So I think one of the things that has been an unlock and an enabler for us is really framing the problem that way. We offer mail order services and retail services. I refuse to define it that way. It's really just home delivery of medication. Like, is that convenient? And in a lot of instances, we feel like it's going to be a really big positive option that didn't exist. You can move away from that binary question of there's only one way to consume or engage with this healthcare, And if you can't do it, you don't get care. I think that's a travesty. And so what inspires us are all the, you know, the entities that are trying to change. We're not alone. We shared the Blue Shield. You know, if you look at Paul, the CEO of Blue Shield of California's announcement, they are trying, there are people trying to reimagine healthcare, And I think it's going to come with choices and connectivity. You mentioned the disconnected piece. Doctors, when they're prescribing, they don't know if the medication's available. They don't know the cost. They don't know whether it's covered. These are solvable problems, regardless of where you choose to seek care or get your prescriptions filled. We have to enable agency at the point of care. That's one of the other things that I know we're wrapping up. But the partnering that Amazon does, it's not a, it's us. What I heard all day long was we partner with various entities across the supply chain to predict and distribute. So you've got the right products, you've got them in the right distribution hubs, and delivery is easy-ish because you've managed it meticulously. Yeah, we're investing for the long term on a patient-centric model, but we know we can't get there alone. I mean, we talk about the coupons on branded medications. Each and every one of those is done in partnership with a pharmaceutical manufacturer to help customers save money. We work with Prime Therapeutics, who's one of the pharmacy benefit managers for many of the Blues plants. We're inspired by everyone working on this, but we're also energized by kind of the progress we're seeing and the customer response. Amazon Clinic, these are third-party providers, 96% CSAT for people who are choosing to engage digitally in healthcare. That's crazy. That is their independent experience, whether it's chronic care and they've got something that maybe was a privacy issue and they didn't feel comfortable going in and talking about, or whether it's acute and they just woke up feeling unwell and they can get treated while they're at home, relaxed, not you know exposing others. I just think we're at the beginning of something that's going to be really powerful. Thank you both for sharing your stories, for the work you're doing to help people be well, not sick, and for those who are ill to get better, quicker, and cheaper. Thank you. Thank you. In this segment, we're going to be talking to Ty Brady, Chief Technologist, Amazon Robotics, and we're going to discuss how to build collaborative robots. Welcome, Ty. You made a big announcement today. Can you share with our listeners where your focus is right now? Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate you taking the time with me. Today, we reimagine how we do our fulfillment inside of our Amazon buildings. It's a system that we call Sequoia, and it is a containerized storage solution that allows us not only to improve the efficiencies that we have inside of our buildings, but also improve safety for our employees. So this is a robot. It's a robotic system. It involves multiple robots, 
That's what's kind of our special sauce that we have inside of Amazon. We know how to stitch together multiple robotic agents together and to work around people in a seamless way. We have robots that actually will bring the goods to a station automatically. We store our goods in these containers, think of them as like totes, just little totes where we store our actual goods. And at the right time, a robot will go underneath these pods that contain the totes and they'll bring it over to a station. Another robot will actually pull those totes off of the pod and then present that to a person at a, just the right height, an ergonomic height for them to actually pick the goods for the order. So it's really exciting to see in person. And it's, I think, a great example of us not only improving efficiencies, but also improving safety for employees. It was a blast just walking around the warehouse on the catwalk. Yeah. And watching these stacks of pods moving around by themselves. So aisles and and it looked like a beehive. Yeah. These just stacks of things were yeah. moving with no people. Well, there's people at the periphery of what we call structured fields. So we move inventory automatically, but people are very much at the center of our robotics universe. Everything that we do is with safety in mind. Everything that we do, I like to say that we put people at the center of the robotics universe. So where you saw those pods moving, that we were optimizing what storage needs to be where. And at the right time, it'll go over to a station where a person will actually pick or stow items into those pods at the right time. If you are a fan of robotics, to to see the many, many drives. We have more than 750,000 drives alone. Those are just the mobile drives that are moving the pods deployed around the globe. It's incredible to see that working at such a scale of Amazon. We just wrote a book on leadership in the age of AI. Yeah. And I was delighted to hear you talking this morning about what I'll call in shorthand the hybrid workforce, humans and machines, so robots and other kinds of robotic process automation. And we got to see a bipedal robot. So how do you use AI to develop your robots to optimize anything operations within Amazon. AI has really changed the game in robotics. It has fundamentally changed uh, computer vision and the perception of scenes. And I work at an exceptional company at Amazon in that we have been using machine learning systems really from the get-go. So you can imagine from the early days when Jeff first started the company, it's really hard to predict where inventory needs to go. From very early on, we've had machine learning systems that help us predict the supply and actually where that supply should be. So we've been using AI for a number of years. We also offer a, quite a large tool set for other companies to use our AI systems through Amazon Web Services or AWS. Just even with generative AI alone, we have over 100,000 companies that are using our services for it. So we've been at the forefront of AI for a number of years. When it comes to machine learning and, and robotics, it really has changed the game. Like what I said in computer vision and the perception systems, for us to understand different objects and to identify the millions and millions of objects that we offer on Amazon.com. We do that with machine learning systems and the ability to pick up an object, whether it's a package or it's an object that we have for sale for our customers. Machine learning systems really help categorize and allow us what we call grasp affordance. So if we want to actually pick that up, how to smartly pick that up at the right point. And we have systems that not only do that, but they also share their learnings with other robotic systems simultaneously. It's really amazing to see. So if there's one defect with something that we're picking up and something that's unusual about that, our other using the, the software that our amazing women and men engineers and scientists have uh, developed, that'll actually propagate instantly to uh, the rest of the fleet. And they'll learn about that particular object. In our mobile fleet, those robots that are actually moving the pods, think of this as a traffic controller, an air traffic controller that can tell what robot to go at what time. Uh, we have some pretty complicated machine learning systems behind that that allows for the sequestration and for the movement of our bots to happen seamlessly behind the scenes to bring the right good at the right time to our customer's door. Really is, is transforming uh, robotics in every measurable way. A really exciting time to be in robotics as well. And the work that we're doing with applied robotics, so not just doing the research about what's possible in robotics, but what is in robotics today, I think our team is at really at the forefront of that. What it gets really exciting is that you can imagine if we master the fundamentals of robotics, that our mobility solutions, our manipulation solutions, our sortation, our storage identification solutions, our packaging solutions, once we master that and achieve a world-class capability, which we're well on our way, we really unlock the keys to the kingdom and we allow to have a more productive and efficient fulfillment process for our customers and also a safer environment for our employees. And we're, we're seeing that benefit today.
And safety and sustainability seem like two themes we've heard throughout the keynotes and the tours that Everything from the robots putting objects at waist height so people aren't lifting and bending and things so you're not getting stress. Yes, there's nothing more important than the safety of our employees. We've invested heavily into uh, safety for sure. We've put more than a billion dollars in safety from 2019 to 2022. We have 8,000 folks. Their full-time job is just to think about safety of our employees, and uh, we bring them in early on in the design phase. That's starting to pay off. We see as compared to our manual buildings, our robotics-enabled buildings have reduced the recordable injury rate by 15% and the lost time on job by 18%. So we're starting to see that pay off in a way where we can gain both productivity gains and also improve safety. So we're really excited about that. It is on the backs of some of the smartest people that I know on the planet. And I'm really uh, proud to work with them. Ty, having worked in organizations for decades now, and you have too, the range of organizations where we come up with something new and it flounders and takes a long time to get implemented to what I assume is a, just a, absolutely a culture of innovation. The volume of changes we've seen this year, it sounds like last year you had a similar volume of changes. What is it in the culture that permeates everything that allows these innovations to happen quickly and also allows you to attract and retain these brilliant people that don't just keep leaving? It's something that I'm really, really proud of. It's a culture of innovation. It starts with our leadership principles. It starts by modeling the right behavior. But most importantly, it starts with kind people, people that are willing to give more than they take people that are pioneers that want to change the world for the better, people that really want a challenge in applied robotics. So in robotic systems that will definitely change e-commerce, and we've seen that historically, we've seen that since our large investment in robotics in 2012. We've created hundreds of thousands of jobs. We've created all kinds of new job types. But what is really profound is the impact and the learning of the core fundamentals of robotics that's going to allow us to not only do e-commerce better, but I believe, as history will show, when we look back at this time of applied robotics and what it is that we're doing, that we'll find that collaborative robotics is the key to automation. Putting people at the center of the robotics universe is a fundamental to actually achieving great things in productivity while also creating a safer environment. And I believe that it will actually go beyond even just e-commerce. I think it's going to affect the medical field agriculture, fishing, automotive, you, you pick your sector, I think that this is the right approach and that we're pioneering this approach. And why I am excited and I share the excitement with our team is I do believe that over time it will actually impact society for the good. I think that when we have a human purpose design philosophy that allows humans to be more human, humans to be more capable, and we give them the tools to extend their capability in any way that they see fit, that's when magic happens. And we're seeing that inside our fulfillment centers today. People-centered or people partnering with robots, what does that look like? Because you said there were people around the outside. We hear all the concerns about jobs going away. We also know we have a shortage of people to do jobs. How do we match those humans that exist, jobs that need to be done in a way that reduces the friction and does create this better future. Yeah, I think our data is pretty clear. Since our investment in robotics in 2012, we created hundreds of thousands of new jobs. We even went through a time of COVID where many people were laid off from their jobs, and we had the ability to hire them and employ them in meaningful ways that were really big deal to the individuals for sure. And we could not have done that with our robotics. There's two key elements. One is our amazing people, and I'll always start with our, our frontline employees, our employees that manufacture our robots, our employees that support, deploy, and design our robotic systems, that in combination with the actual machines themselves, right? So the sum of the parts doesn't equal the overall whole, that the benefit that we get out of it. Where if it was just people doing it alone, I think we would not be as productive as we are today. And if it was just machines doing it alone, I can assure you with my, I like to say now, 30 plus years of experience, there's no such thing as a perfect automation system. It just doesn't exist. You will always need intervention in some way in order to make that system better. But when they're done right, when you reframe your relationship with machines, you can both improve productivity and also improve safety for employees. 
We're doing that with an announcement today with Sequoia. We've done that in 2022 with our prior announcements. If you want to see a great example of a collaborative robot, it's our Proteus robot. That's that little green robot that is super cute, super cool to see. And what it does is it carries a container of packages to the outbound dock. And it can do that around people and around groups of people, right? Which is really awesome. So imagine that we're at a cocktail party and it's crowded and you need to get to the other side of the room. You will find your way and you'll kind of delicately go here to here to here. And you'll make your way in a way that's not obtrusive to all the other guests. Well, Proteus can do something very similar. And instead of just stopping and waiting for the party to end, Proteus can actually make its way through a crowd of people doing their natural job in their natural environment and get the job done at hand. And we do that through some really clever engineering. We do that through visual cues. We do that through audible cues. We do that in just the way that the robot itself behaves around people to not only signal intent to a person that is looking at our Proteus vehicle, mm -hmm. but also for the person to look at the Proteus vehicle and understand what it wants to do. That's what I call this beautiful ballet of people and machines working together. And at a cocktail party, I just wear black in case I spill my wine, <laughs> in case someone backs up into me. I can understand that. I assume that if Proteus is carrying a smaller amount, people could also back into it and it responds. Yeah. So Proteus has a safety bubble around it and it responds to people walking towards it or walking away from it. It always defers to what a person wants to do and it'll adjust according to the person. So if the person wants to stop, that's completely okay. If we're designing our machines right, like what we've done with Proteus, it understands that and it'll just gently make its way around that person. If a person wants to pass Proteus, that's okay as well. Proteus will kind of defer to the person, let the person pass and continue to move along in its job. It's really magical to see uh, in person. It's really amazing. So you've programmed Yes, Dear into that? <laughs> just about, yeah. It is great to see. I mean, it is, especially when you see multiple robots working at the same time. And they'll interact with each other as well. So not only will they interact with people in their environment, which is what we've designed the machines to do, but even the machines will, one will come around one corner, one will be on the other corner. It's like, after you, please go ahead and then work its way on and get the job done at hand. What I love about it is it's allowing our folks to think on higher level tasks. If I can eliminate the menial, the mundane, the repetitive, just pushing a cart to an outbound dock, we can do that, Right. I can do that better with a machine and allow our people to focus on higher level things. So as we wrap up, what one thing would you like listeners to take away from this conversation? That dreams can really come true. This career journey, the Amazon experience has been exceptional, that you get to work with amazing people doing pioneering work is a dream come true for myself. And when you have a collection of kind, like-minded people with purpose, and with an insatiable curiosity that you can really move mountains. And I believe that we're doing incredible work when it comes to people and machines working together. We're proud of that work. And it's a lifelong dream that we're not done yet. And I'm just as excited as you are to see where we go with it. And in my heart of hearts, I know that it's going to be for the betterment of society and that what the team is doing today is going to have a profound effect for not only robotics, but automation in general. And we're just getting started. And we're just getting started. I know you've got 30 plus years and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't be doing this 30 plus years from now, but the next generation that you train will. Yeah, for sure. We've met many young, eager scientists and engineers, and I can't meet enough of them. I want to inspire every young girl, every young boy out there that technology is amazing. Technology is cool. Technology will better our human condition. Uh, technology will help save planet Earth as well. And embracing this mindset that technology can do good for not only yourself, but for others is a really great mindset. And I think that generally applies whether you're at home or if you're in the workplace inside of Amazon, those principles actually still stay true. Ty, thank you so much. This has been fun and insightful. My pleasure. I'll see you at the cocktail party. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>